just a couple housekeeping items before we before we begin. This is being recorded and it'll be posted on our website in just a few days. Um, if you have not muted yourself, please do so. Um, and also, as we go through the talk this evening, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat box and we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. So uh, now I'll turn it over to Caitlin and uh, thank you all for joining us. Caitlin. Thanks, Susie. Thanks for the invitation to come and speak today. Um, welcome everybody. Thanks for spending your evening with me. Um, tonight I'm gonna be talking about uh, tiny cotton balls or invasive forest pests, the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, <laughs> as Susie said, my name is Caitlin DeWitt. I'm the forest health specialist with the Virginia Department of Forestry. Um, and we do a lot of work with the hemlock woolly adelgid, which you'll hear about in the course of my talk today. So why did I say, there we go. <laughs> why did I say tiny cotton balls or invasive forest pests? Uh, we are talking about the hemlock woolly adelgid. And this is what the pest looks like on a hemlock branch in the woods. Um, so I joke about the tiny cotton balls because I always say that's kind of the distinguishing characteristic of hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, it looks like if you turn over a hemlock branch um, at the base of the needles, you see these tiny little white balls um, attached to them. And that is actually each little white cotton ball is an adelgid in that ovisac or that protective kind of woolly flocculence casing um, feeding at the base of the hemlock needles. So we'll get into a lot about this uh, pest, why it's bad, um, but I just wanted to start off of why we think it looks like little cotton balls. Um, I'm also going to back up and talk a little bit about hemlock species worldwide. Um, so there are a number of hemlock or suga species that are found um, around the world. And I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the Suga diversifolia and Suga seaboldii over here in Japan. Um, and then there's also two species of Suga in the Pacific Northwest, Suga heterophylla and Suga mertensiana. Um, those are some that I'll be touching on that have some importance later on. And then obviously on the East Coast, we have our two native hemlock species, Suga canadensis and Suga caroliniana. Um, but there are a number of hemlocks worldwide, um, and they all are very lovely and beautiful and hold a special place in everyone's hearts. Um, specifically, eastern hemlocks, um, I always like to kind of start my presentations about Adelgid with this lovely quote um, from the Natural History of Trees in Eastern and Central North America, because I think it really does kind of capture the majesty and the beauty of hemlocks. Um, they are in my top three favorite tree species, so they hold a special place in my heart. Um, and I just like it. it, says, in the grand high places of the Southern mountains, hemlocks soar above the rest of the forest, rising like a church spire, like numberless spires as far as the eye can see through the blue haze that is the natural atmosphere of those ranges. Um, and if you've ever been fortunate enough to be in an area that has a large population of hemlocks, you can really understand and kind of get the picture that this quote is capturing. Um, they really are just beautiful. Um, they used to take up big, large sections of forest um, and really just, just a special species. Um, Specifically, they're special um, and have an importance in the ecosystem because they are long-lived, late successional and climax species, meaning that they really dominate the ecosystem in which they grow. So, you know, frequently found along riparian areas, um, they really like to grow in these areas together um, and they have numerous benefits to wildlife and other plant species. So, you know, in the snowy wintertime, deer will frequently bed underneath them. Um, birds will nest in them, um, you know, their, their cones are important for a number of wildlife to feed on. Um, they also have an important role since they do kind of grow in these riparian areas along streams. Um, they regulate the microenvironment in that um, they actually cool the streams enough that certain species like trout really rely on them to keep them at temperatures that keep the trout and other fish species comfortable. Um, I also mentioned the aesthetic value. I really, if you've been in a hemlock stand, you really will know um, just truly how beautiful they are. And it seems kind of like it's a magical place or something that just seems like it would be out of a book. Um, so I, I have a really true respect for hemlocks um, and they, they have a 
nice place in the ecosystem as well. Um, so I talked about hemlocks worldwide and there's a number of species. Uh, in the Eastern United States, we have two, Eastern hemlock, Suga canadensis, and Carolina hemlock, Suga caroliniana. Um, this map shows the range of both those native species. And you can see that Eastern hemlock has quite a large range through um, the mountains of North Georgia, all the way through the mid-Atlantic, up into Maine and um, Canada, all the way over into like Michigan and Wisconsin. So they have a huge range. Um, and in that area, they, they fill a really great role, like I said earlier. Um, and then Suga uh, Caroliniana or Carolina hemlock has a smaller and limited range um, found throughout the mountains of North Carolina. We've got spots of it here in Virginia. Um, and that's typically found in isolated pockets of high elevation and rocky slopes. Um, so really important in these areas because it's kind of considered a rare species. Um, and both of these species are at risk for the hemlock woolly adelgid. So what is the hemlock woolly adelgid? Um, the hemlock woolly adelgid has kind of an interesting history in that, uh, especially in Virginia, it was first found in Richmond, Virginia in the early 1950s. Um, it was found on, or brought over on, excuse me, some imported stock from the Japanese hemlocks um, to be planted in a Japanese botanical garden. And um, looking at that, thinking back to that map of where the hemlock species are, um, you know, worldwide, the native range of HWA, which is what I'm gonna call it, just abbreviated, because hemlock really delgid is kind of a, a mouthful. Uh, the native range of HWA is throughout Asia, and interestingly enough, the Pacific Northwest of the United States. So those two species up in, um, you know, the Washington, Oregon, into uh, Alaska and um, British Columbia, that is considered native up there. Um, it's not considered a pest. They have a whole slew of um, native species that help keep it in check. Um, so really, HWA is only considered problematic and has caused damage on our eastern species. Um, hemlock leodelgid is kind of an interesting creature. I'll get into its life cycle in the next slide. Um, but in this bottom photo, you can see there's this little white insect that looks kind of squishy. Um, so they are similar to aphids in that they're soft-bodied hemipterans. So they have a piercing sucking mouth part that they insert into the plant tissue and suck up plant nutrients that way. Um, and then they produce the filamentous wax-like product, uh, the woolly flocculants, to help protect itself and the eggs. So what you're seeing in each of those little cotton balls is really just this little black squishy thing underneath. <laughs> um, so they're not very beautiful uh, insects. You know, we've got some other major forest pests in Virginia, like emerald ash borer, which is very like stunning and showy looking. Uh, HWA is not glamorous looking at all, um, but it, it does still have a very big role in um, decline of our native hemlock species. So HWA life cycle is complicated and a little unique. <laughs> um, they're kind of a weird insect in that, you know, here we are at the tail end of summer. We've been experiencing bugs for good or for bad. All, all summer. Um, HWA is actually an active winter pest. Um, and so one of the things that they do, they have two generations per year, the cistins, which is the long lasting generation that goes from midsummer all the way into um, early spring. And then we've got the progredience generation, which is shorter um, and just goes from late spring to early summer. Now in its native range, um, in the progredients generation, there is a sexual stage where the adelgid will develop wings and will fly to an alternate host, a spruce species, um, and then it will come back and start the system generation again. Um, in the eastern United States, they have evolved without that because they did not find an active or an appropriate spruce species to complete this. So what we have in the eastern United States is actually um, a parthenogenic female. So basically the female in each of those little cotton balls, she just makes little clones of herself. She does not require any sexual reproduction to produce young. So each of the adelgids will lay her eggs in her little woolly cotton ball and all of them will be tiny little clones of herself. <laughs> um, so they're kind of weird little alien creatures like that. Um, Basically what happens is they have the eggs, we'll start with the cistins, 
the eggs will hatch in the crawler stage, which is the only mobile stage of this pest. Um, they have tiny little legs. They can move and disperse to other parts of the tree. They don't go very far because they are very tiny um, and have tiny little legs, but <laughs> they will move to different parts of the tree. Um, they'll go through a summer dormancy or estivation sit period as nymphs, and they'll reemerge in early fall, um, September, October. And that's when they will go through their second, third, and fourth nymphal stage. Um, they'll settle, they'll start to produce that woolly flocculence, they'll develop into adults over the winter. And the whole time, they, once they've settled, they have um, inserted their piercing sucking mouth parts into the base of the tree, and they are feeding during the winter. And this is what causes damage to the tree because they are feeding on the tree's stored photosynthate and nutrient reserves. Um, and so what that means is basically a slow death for the hemlocks because you know they've worked all summer collecting sunlight, turning that into food for them, storing that so they can put on a new flush in spring the following year. Um, and effectively these trees are just sucking away that stored reserve and so the trees aren't able to produce a new flush of nutrients the following spring. So what you get from this, especially in high populations of adelgid, are you can get mortality um, in as little as five to 10 years, which for tiny little insects is actually quite fast, I think, for you know large trees. Um, so they do that. The adults will then make her little clones. We go to the progredians. Instead of having um, the adult sexual stage, again, she just lays clones. So they're just keeping making little clones of themselves all the time. Um, so it's kind of a unique life stage. And like I said, they're active during the winter. Um, so it makes field work very interesting for this because instead of being out during the summer, which is typically our busy season in the agency, whenever we do adelgid work, um, you know, we're out in the fall and the winter. Um, so anyways, that's a very abbreviated life stage. It's very complicated. If anybody has questions about this, we can go through it at the end. Um, but that's just kind of the quick and dirty of the life cycle. So Again, we've got these tiny little cotton balls at the base of the needles. Um, you can rub them. <laughs> they will you know, kind of disintegrate underneath you. If you squish them, you'll get a little bit of the hemolymph or the insect blood will squish out. Um, but you, know, you see this and you're like, that doesn't look so bad. You're not seeing any of the major characteristics of other insect pests. It's not defoliation, like if it was from spongy moth. It's not, um, you know, crown dieback from like emerald ash borer, you know, some of our other invasive pests. But you look at this and you're like, that tree looks fine overall. But again, over the course of years, you get forests that look like this. This image is taken from um, Smoky Mountain National Park in North Carolina. And you can just see all of these little gray skeletons of hemlocks that once were dominant in this forest um, and have since been killed because of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so it's really, really devastating. And you can see how this changes over time, um, you know, an entire ecosystem when you lose these giant hemlocks. Um, so really, really tragic to see. Um, when we look at the spread of HWA over the years, um, so we have a map of the Eastern United States and the green is the native range of Eastern hemlock. So again, you can see it goes from North Georgia all the way up into Maine and, um, and Canada. And then we have counties over here. And each of these are the counties that have been infested in the year that they were infested by hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so you can see that in Virginia, most of the area where we have Eastern hemlock has been infested for quite some time. Um, all the way going up into uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Let's see if I can get my mouse over here, this little yellow. That was fairly recent. Um, I know this map is a little old. The last date was 2017, so it's a few years out of date now. I know it's gone up into Maine a little bit more as well. Um, you know, another unfortunate thing to think about as we think about climate change is that as things get warmer, our winters are not as cold. Um, this pest can move or other pests like it can actually move into new ranges where they were further limited because of cool temperatures. So, um, you know, this is something that Maine's trying to get a hold of now, I know, um, but they're, they're starting to see more and more counties pop up with it just because their, their winters are not as cold as they have been, which is, is a limiting and deterrent factor for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, 
Virginia Tech used to do hemlock woolly adelgid surveys for us here at the Department of Forestry. Um, again, this map or this chart, excuse me, is a little old. It's from 2017, but I like to include it in my presentations because they collected a lot of great data and it shows the trend very clearly. So starting in 1997, when they started doing these um, surveys around Virginia, you can see that the green line starts to go, let's see if I can get my map, starts to go up. And this is the percent hemlock mortality. And at the same time, we have the percent stand health index going down. Um, and then this purple line are the number of branches infested. And that does look pretty, you know, it has peaks and valleys in it, um, which correlates a lot to winter temperatures. So if we have extreme winter temperatures, that will knock populations back, but then they will rebound. Um, and so you have these kind of peaks and valleys, but the overall trend still continues that stand health index goes down and hemlock mortality goes up. Um, and they, they had a number of uh, sites around Virginia. And so this is kind of all compiled over all of those sites. Um, so you can see that this, this pest really is um, causing some mortality and some significant damage to the hemlock stands in Virginia. Um, and I'm sure, you know, as if they continued this since 2017, again, the hemlock mortality would continue to go up. So there is a little bit of hope. Uh, there are methods of controlling the adelgid. Um, there's insecticide options. So you can do um, insecticidal soap, horticultural oils, there's soil injections, there's trunk injections. Um, I'll touch on those in a little bit. Uh, silvicultural control, restoration of impacted areas, reducing stress from common forestry practices, removing, removing heavily impacted trees. This is something that research is just now starting to really kind of look into a little bit more of how to get hemlocks back into the landscape um, and then ways that they could do some silvicultural practices to try and help um, the hemlocks thrive and maybe uh, reduce adelgid on them. Um, and then cultural control is another one, um, which is kind of a not practical for the long scale um, of, you know, hemlock HWA control, but it's something that you could do in your yard. So not placing bird feeders in trees. Um, you know, you might wonder how does this tiny little pest that can't fly, can only crawl for a certain amount of time, um, how does it move and how is it spread? all the way from Virginia up into Maine and parts of Canada. Um, wildlife is a way that it can spread. So um, if you ever go out in a, a forest and there's an infestation of HWA, um, if you accidentally brush up against them, especially if you have fleece, they stick to you really easily. Um, it's really easy to brush those off. And so if you think about that, you know, with birds or deer or anything that might be moving in and out of these trees, they can easily hitchhike on, um, you know, their fur or their, their feathers, anything like that. Um, I'm not trying to blame all wildlife, of course. Um, so humans obviously have a, a hand in spreading HWA and, you know, we brought it over here in the first place, but cultural control is an easy one that um, you can do if you just want to protect the trees in your yard or give them an extra layer of protection. So, Chemical treatment is very, very effective for hemlock woolly adelgid. These are tiny sap sucking insects. They're not giant insects. Um, you know, they stay on the tree for extended periods of time. So they're great for doing chemical treatments. Um, there are a number of ways that you can do it. There's a soil drench like me. I'm on the ground doing a drench on the image on the far right. There's an injection, um, which is what Lori, my counterpart, is doing on the image on the left, a soil injection, um, and then there's Cortec tablets, which you can, they're little tablets that you can stick in the soil. Um, for these treatments, there are two main chemicals that are used um, and are considered to be the best treatments available. Um, one uses the active ingredient, imidacloprid, and the other uses the active ingredient, dinotefurin. Now, um, I'll go through kind of the pros of them. So imidacloprid is great for just kind of a baseline population of adelgid, and it's long lasting and it's good in a tree tissue for five to seven years. So really, really effective if you wanna do treatments. Um, you don't have to do them every year like you do with some of the other pests. Um, you know, you do one treatment, it's good, it's cost effective. 
it's easy to do. You can see here I am, I'm literally just pouring the amount of chemical at the base of the tree for the tree to take up and distribute in its tissue. Dinotefurin is the other one that's really good. That one is not as long lived in the tree's tissue. That one is only good for one year. However, it has a much faster um, take up period within the tree's tissue. And so if you have a heavy population of HWA, we like to tell people to immediately treat with dinotefurin to knock that population back. And then a year later to follow up with a drench or an injection of imidacloprid to give it that long lasting protection for five to seven years. Um, and any of these kinds of treatments, the drench, the injection, the tablets, they're gonna use one of these chemicals. Um, most of them are imidacloprid. So that is really good for, you know, just protecting these trees for a long period of time. Um, the negative with these two treatments is that they are neonicotinoids. They're in the class neonicotinoid, which is one of the chemicals that has been implicated in pollinator decline. Um, and so if you read the label, there are watch out scenarios for doing these treatments um, around flowering plants um, in areas where, you know, if there's active bee colonies, don't do it. Um, and then if you're close to water, there's a watch out situation because it can be dangerous to air, um, to like mac macro invertebrates and also uh, fish. So that's why, you know, you can look at the different treatment options. Like the injection is much safer if you're right by a stream because it goes directly into the tree. So there's no concern if you have, um, you know, water right beside it. Or, you know, if you have like a rose bush right next to your hemlock, you could do an injection and there would not be an issue with that rose bush. Um, the good thing about HWA, since it is a winter active species, um, you can do these treatments pretty much year round as long as there's no frost on the ground or like, no, it, the ground is not frozen basically. Um, so what we like to do is do them um, in fall or in um, early, early, early spring before anything comes out. So that way we don't have to worry about flowering plants or anything that might be popping up in the area. Um, if we should see a flowering plant, Usually we just pull that up um, and then, you know, make sure it won't keep flowering and not bring in any, uh, any pollinators in. Um, one of the things that we use very heavily for our treatment, and I would recommend any of you guys look up if you want to treat trees, um, Dr. Elizabeth Benton McCarty with the University of Georgia, she wrote this. It's called the Optimized Insecticide Dosage for Hemlock Adelgid. And basically she spent a lot of time and research and effort um, reading the labels, following the labels, and optimizing them to make sure that you could do the most work and most control of HWA with the least amount of chemical. And then in that, she talks about all the different ways of treatment. She talks about the chemical, and then she also makes cheat sheets that you can use when you want to treat. So you're using very little chemical, but having the most effect for HWA control. So I recommend you guys um, check this out if you have any interest in um, looking about looking at HWA control in your hemlock trees. Dr. McCartney also, because there's a lot of concern about um, the long lasting residual efficacy of these chemicals in the ecosystem. She also has just recently come out with a new document where she looks at the levels in um, rare plants, in arthropod, soil arthropods, and in some of the macroinvertebrates around streams. Um, and that's a really great read. And basically, you know, there's, I'll let you guys read it. I'll put it in there. She found that, of course, there's, there's trade-offs to everything, but basically there's a small dip in, you know, the overall health of some of these species immediately following a treatment, but within a year or two after the treatment, there's no effect. So it's pretty much out of the soil, it's in the tree, it's good to go. It's a really, really wonderful document um, that kind of, I think it helps calm a lot of my concerns about doing some of these treatments in areas. And um, she did a really good job with that. So I can send that in the chat at the end if anybody's interested. So where has the Department of Forestry done chemical treatments? Um, we have done a number of them. We're kind of just starting our program for treatments. And so in the last two or three years, We've treated at four parks, um, and here's the locations. And then most recently, this spring, we treated at Ivy Creek. Um, 
So that was exciting to be able to help protect some of the trees at Ivy Creek. So um, eight trees were treated in the woods along the field trail. Um, they're tucked away. Of course, the um, reservoir is downhill. And so the trees are not really on the water. They're kind of along the, the woods in there scattered throughout. Um, we treated them in April 13th, 2022 and gave those protections again, five to seven years. We did a soil drench with imidacloprid on those. Very little chemical was used. Um, and I think that the benefits from this treatment kind of outweigh anything that we could be concerned about just because now those trees will be protected from HWA and will continue to live in the woods um, and be, be happy and thrive. So all of those treatments that I just said, insecticide, silvicultural and cultural control, are these methods effective in the forest setting? I say, yes, they're very effective in the forest setting. However, are these methods practical in the forest setting? If they're practical, you know, if it's in your own yard or your own woods, then yeah, I think you can, you know, if you have the time and the money to invest in treatment, definitely practical, definitely a great thing to do. Now, when you think about the entire range of Eastern Hemlock up and down the East Coast, you cannot go out and feasibly treat every tree, unfortunately. I wish you could. Um, so in that case, I don't think that those methods are practical in the grand scheme of the forest setting. And that's where biological control comes in. Um, biological control, by definition, is the control of a pest by the introduction of a natural enemy or predator. Um, and a lot of work has gone into biological control of Hemlock woolly adelgid. So um, since kind of the early 2000s, really, they've looked at a number of species, um, mostly beetles, to be released for biological control. And these are kind of the four big ones that they've spent a lot of time and effort into. So both uh, Laracobius osicensis and Siskagesimnus sugi are from Asia. And then Laracobius nigrenus and Skimnus coniferarum are from the Pacific Northwest. Now, Skimnus canivarum and Sasaja Skimnus sugi are okay. They did an okay job. Um, but really, the bulk of the focus for the biological control efforts of HWA have gone into the two Laracobia species, Laracobia nigrinus and Laracobia osicensis. So, Laracobia nigrinus, as I mentioned, is found in the Pacific Northwest on Western Hemlock. So, um, thinking way back to the beginning when I showed that map, um, you know, HWA is found on the North, the Pacific Northwestern hemlock species and is not a pest because Laracobius nigrinus is the main control for HWA in that area. Laracobius osicensis is native to Japan um, and comes from the exact same location of the source of HWA in the Eastern United States. So Laracobius osicensis would be considered, I guess both of them really, would be considered a classical biological control of going back to the native range of the pest and bringing back its main predator. Um, Laracobius osicensis holds a special place in my heart because this is what I studied for my master's <laughs> at Virginia Tech. Um, and you can see in this image down here, these are osicensis down here, and they're, they're very tiny little beetles. Um, and Laracobius is specific. They are adelgid predators. So they do not feed on anything else except other adelgid species. And osicensis can only feed and reproduce on hemlock woolly adelgid. So it's a very safe species. Um, so safe, in fact, that in 2010, after a long time in quarantine at Virginia Tech, um, the USDA APHIS released a FONSI or a finding of no significant impact for Laracobius osicensis to be field released in the eastern United States. Um, well, I guess the, all of the United States, but specifically at this time in the Eastern United States to control Adelgid sugi or hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, so a lot of work went into this in quarantine showing that, um, you know, it can only feed, it can only reproduce on hemlock woolly adelgid and no other adelgid species. So um, hopefully that calms some concerns. I know, you know, sometimes biological control does not have a great reputation, but they are trying to get better at that. <laughs> and so Ozakensis is very safe and very uh, host specific. So we have done a number of biological control releases um, as an agency. Um, again, this is something we're trying to get more into. Um, all of ours come from the insectary or the rearing facility at Virginia Tech. 
Um, and we have done both Negrinus and Osakensis, and we've released them at James River State Park, Nature Camp in Vesuvius, Virginia, and Ribbon Rock Park in Harrisonburg. Um, and James River State Park, the first release of that was done in the early 2010s. And um, we go back and we monitor that spot still. And the, um, the Laracobius population has really taken off and has established itself and is controlling Adelgid out there. It's a really, it's a really nice program to go see and it's very successful. Um, so we're happy to go out there and find the little Laracobius beetles whenever we try. Now, there is a new kid on the block and this is Leucotaraxis argenticolis. And these are actually predatory flies and they feed on HWA eggs in the spring. And so the hope is that these can work in conjunction with the Laracobius beetles um, because the Laracobius beetles are so well timed with that um, cystins generation or the generation that is more long lasting from fall to spring. Um, and so they're feeding throughout the winter as long as the adelgid is out feeding. Um, and the flies kind of pick up that early spring population right after the adults lay eggs. And so the hope is that these two can work together um, and really just kind of do a one-two punch on HWA out in the field. And so this is one of our foresters doing a release. We got our first release of this in 2020, hence the mask. <laughs> this is a good day to be out in the woods. <laughs> um, and these are not as abundant quite yet as the Laracobius beetles. These are being released um, from, well, they're, they're being reared from Cornell, but they're native to the Pacific Northwest, again, kind of like Laracobius nigrinus. Um, so they have people collecting from the Pacific Northwest, bringing to Cornell to make sure that they are all the Leucotaraxis or Genicolis, and then they send them out from the rearing facility. Um, for cooperators to release in the woods. So it's a big, robust program for biocontrol um, uh, with a number of participating universities and organizations. Um, it's kind of a really nice success story. Um, so here's where we did the purple uh, star. That's Sandy Point State Forest. That's where we did the Leucotaraxis. Um, this is kind of a unique uh, spot for hemlocks, just funny story. Uh, it's one of our state forests in the eastern part of the state, and there's not a lot of hemlock in the eastern part of the state, um, but there's a beautiful population out here right on the river, and um, we think it was maybe an old homestead or something. So anyways, we want to protect those, and since they're close to the river and the watershed, um, our forester that maintains this, he does not want to do chemical control, so he was really excited to do biological control out there. So um, you know, we look at this map and we say, okay, DOF has done four releases. That doesn't sound like a lot when you consider that most of the western part of Virginia has adelgid on its hemlocks. Um, but I want to let everyone know that there's more. So this is from the, um, oh, the cooperative, it's like the hemlock woolly adelgid kind of map where everybody puts their release information in. And so again, we've got this green layer that is the Eastern hemlock on the Eastern coast all the way up. Um, and then we've got this kind of like heat map that shows as you get more red and yellow, the number of predator releases. So you can see throughout most of the native range of hemlocks, we have done some sort of releases in a number of states with a number of different cooperators. So there is hope, <laughs> even though we've only done a few here in Virginia as our agency, um, there's a lot more releases and a lot more uh, cooperation with other states and other agencies going on to help with the hemlocks. So they are out there, they're doing their job, and hopefully in time, we'll be able to help control the population below the damaging levels that we've seen in the past. So what does this all mean for the future of hemlocks? Um, as we've kind of gone through, hemlock ecosystems are unique, and we really don't know the full extent of what would happen if we lose these hemlocks from the ecosystem, hence why there's been so much work going on to try and protect them um, with a number of different ways. Uh, there is genetic conservation work that's ongoing, so collecting seeds from trees that seem to be um, you know, holding out, even though they're surrounded by trees that have died from HWA. Um, 
things like that. Uh, the silvicultural efforts that I mentioned, um, there's some research going on with the US Forest Service and folks at NC State where they're actually making patches around infected trees because they're finding that the, hem the HWA really doesn't like direct sunlight on them. It kind of makes them too hot. So they're very temperature sensitive. They don't want it to be too hot. They don't want it to be too cold. Um, and so they're finding that if the trees are receiving direct sunlight, that can help maybe lower some of the HWA populations on the trees. So things like that. They're also doing planting back in areas where hemlocks have died and doing like deer exclusion, um, you know, planting treated trees, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's continuous research at a number of universities going on about the combination of chemical and biological control within sites together in conjunction, um, all of that. So there, there's a lot of work still going on to try and protect these trees and to try and lessen the impact of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So what can you do? Um, sometimes my talks can be very depressing because they're about problematic forest pests. And so I always kind of like to try and end on a positive note. <laughs> um, so the easiest way is check on your hemlocks. If you have hemlocks in your yard, check on them, make sure that they, you're not seeing these little cotton balls. Um, they look okay. There's not a lot of like dieback, um, that sort of thing. Uh, I mentioned the bird feeders. If you're gonna put bird feeders up in your yard, just don't put them on your hemlock tree just so uh, the little birds can't accidentally pick up any adelgids that might be on there. Um, if you buy hemlocks from a nursery or if you buy anything else, you know, this is kind of a good overall <laughs> Just a tip in general, inspect any nursery stock or material for hitchhikers. Um, we know that there's lots of forest pests that like to hitchhike. So just do a quick search before you take your plants home from the nursery. Um, and then also, you know, we here at DOF and the Forest Health Program, we're a great resource. We're always happy to come out and look at your hemlocks. Um, so let us know if you find HWA and if you have questions on how to control them, we're happy to answer those questions. And speaking of questions, um, I'll happily take any now. <laughs> Thanks. Caitlin, you have a, about four in the chat box. Do you want to okay. read them or you want me to read them or? Do, do, do. Uh, let's see, I can read them. So, okay, Robert said, so the larvae produce woolly flocculants immediately after hatching. Um, yeah, Robert, once they have, once they immediately hatch, they go to the crawler stage, and then the crawlers move to their next location where they want to, you know, settle and feed. And once they get there and they turn into um, the next life stage where they actually will settle, um, the, the second nymphal stage, um, they will settle, insert their piercing sucking mouth parts. And then once they do that, they'll start producing the woolly flocculants to try and protect themselves while they're basically just stuck there feeding at the buffet. Um, there was, there was one more that was directed just to me. Okay. Um, what size is the adult say compared to a, nymp a nymphal black leg tip? Oh, okay. Um, they are probably about the same size. Um, so I usually have to use a hand lens when I'm looking for the newly hatched or like the early crawlers. Um, so yeah, they're very small um, and they're just like little black dots if you look at them with the bare eye and then you can, if you have a hand lens, you can look at them that way. So pretty tiny. Um, Barry said, had my trees treated but only lasted two years. Barry, do you know what they treated or did you do it yourself? I know you probably can't respond. I don't um, the reason I ask is, so what, what we are treating with um, for our drenches and our injections, the active ingredient is very high. Um, you can go to like a big box store and get some of the generic and imidacloprid products. Um, and they don't have as high of an active ingredient as what we can get or what an arborist can get. Um, and so I don't know maybe that is what it could be. I don't, I don't know. Um, Bartlett, they said Bartlett soil injection. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. They, it, I don't know. They should last longer than that. I'm sorry that it only lasted two years. Um, um, let's see. John said, how far might the predators spread on their own? 
Um, that's a good question, John, and something that we're still figuring out. I can say anecdotally, um, Shenandoah National Park has released some of the Laracobius beetles on their land in Sugar Hollow. And last December, we went out and we actually surveyed some of the neighboring properties near Sugar Hollow. Um, this is in Albemarle County. Um, and we were probably a good five miles away and we were finding Laracobius on one of the neighboring properties. So they, they can fly on their own. Um, they're tiny, but they can fly. So I don't know an exact like mileage, you know, and this was the, the beetles have been released there for a number of years. So probably, I don't, I don't know how to put it, a good distance, but you know, they can spread on their own and they are spreading, especially as they're building up in populations. Um, okay, Marion said, are the cotton balls only visible certain months of the year? Um, so they're most noticeable right in um, kind of late fall, early winter, because they're the freshest. However, you can see them um, even in the summer months, but they're usually like an older kind of population from like the previous year. Um, depending on if they're continually putting on new flocculants, you know, you can find them. And if you squish them, you can tell if they're alive or not. Because if you, if you squish them in winter and you get like this little like blackish red goo, that's their blood. Um, and so, you know, they're actively feeding. But if you do it like, you know, in the middle of summer when you find uh, a cotton ball, then this probably not gonna squish a whole lot. And that's probably the one from the year past. Caitlin, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I know you said earlier that uh, if we lose the hemlock, it's hard to tell exactly what would happen to our ecosystem and everything. Um, but I know um, like Shenandoah National Park is working really hard and probably other organizations are, as well are working very hard to protect the, the trout that are in the streams up there. Yeah. <clears throat> and you said that, um, that, you know, the trout need a certain temperature and the hemlocks help keep it cool. Um, is that the only species that you all have seen that the hemlocks like really help to thrive or are there other animals that, you know, like the monarch lays its eggs on the milkweed? <laughs> like, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Um, I mean, you know, with forest, there's always going to be succession. So it's not like once we lose the hemlock, nothing will come back in its place. Um, I think the thing is, is that whatever comes back in its place, it will just not be as effective at you know regulating that microenvironment or getting the temperature exactly right for the trout. Um, you know, they, they're long lived species. And so I think that just losing them, there's gonna be a delay. So there will be some changes immediately while we wait for the other species to take over. Um, and that will cause a, a shift. And then also just whatever the shift is, it will help down the line, but I don't know that it will be the same level of help. And then it probably will still take some time, you know, to even get close, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You have any other questions? All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Um, my contact information is up on the slide. <laughs> So if, if you think of anything tonight or, you know, later in the week or just any question about anything forest health related, please shoot me an email or call me. I'm happy to, happy to answer. <laughs> All right. Well, um, let me turn my video back on. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, um, Caitlin, for doing this presentation for us. Um, so interesting and informative. And um, thank you everyone for spending time with us this evening. That you enjoyed it and learned a lot. Uh, I just want to let you know about a few things that Ivy Creek Foundation is doing. Um, we have a couple of events coming up that may be of interest to you. On September 18th at one o'clock, we'll be hosting our September Ivy Talk. Uh, which is Albemarle, Albemarle's Black Classrooms. And our speaker will be Lorenzo Dickerson. 
um, a filmmaker, photographer, and founder of Mall Pin Town Media with uh, documentary films that focus on sharing stories of African American history and culture in Virginia. Um, then on Tuesday, September 13th at five o'clock, we will have a free tree walk at Ivy Creek Natural Area, and maybe you'll get to see some of our hemlocks. Um, on Saturday, September 17th, we're hosting a butterfly hike at 10 a.m. and a plant walk on Sunday, September 25th at 1 p.m. All of these events are free and open to the public, uh, but we do ask that you pre-register uh, because space is limited and you can pre-register through our website at ivycreekfoundation.org. Um, if you enjoyed this talk and would like to support what the Ivy Creek Foundation is doing for our community, please consider going to our website and making a donation today. And again, thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. I'm gonna stop recording now.